Hey everyone, welcome back to the Dr. Jeff Show podcast. This show's available on Apple, Google, Spotify, Liftable, Edify, wherever you get your podcasts. Listen, uh, please tell your friends about this show. You can just forward them the link to it, tell them if you saw a particular guest that you thought was interesting, something that you saw on YouTube. We wanna get as many people as possible signed up for this. Well, why? Just because I wanna have a lot of people on my show? No, because we're interviewing thought leaders who demonstrate that our worldview changes everything. These are conversations that we want as many people to have the opportunity to hear as possible. So today's guest is somebody who I loved as a journalist. I do a lot of radio and TV interviews. And this guy, I've loved being interviewed by him because he's tough, he's fair, he's interesting, he's respectful. And so I just thought we got to get him on the show to talk about what kind of journalism this is. Now, how does somebody like you become become a journalist? Because I hear a lot of bad things as well. So I think it's going to be a fascinating conversation. How do you communicate the truth in a powerful way, in a respectful way, in a culture like ours, especially in the kind of journalistic climate that we have? So his show is on Real America's Voice Network. He's a co-anchor, and the show is called The American Sunrise. I encourage you to check it out. I've been on that show. Love that show. And... The, the guest's name, and I'd like you to please welcome to the show, is Terrence Bates. Terrence Bates, welcome to the Dr. Jeff Show podcast. So good to be here. I appreciate you having me. Well, I, I'm really looking forward to our conversation for a couple reasons, but I want our audience to know you're one of my favorite journalists. When it comes to doing TV interviews, I love being interviewed by you because you're tough, you're fair, you're interested. You're, you're interested in making sure that everything is really clear and straightforward for your audience. It feels like you're the kind of journalist who gives me hope in journalism. So thank you. <laughs> well, well, I appreciate it. That truly is a huge statement there. And I take it as a compliment. Um, you know, it's, it's our job. And so I think if we're going to do the job, let's do it right. Um, and I appreciate the tough and fair. All of those things are important, but I always also try to be respectful. To me, that's the foundation of everything. I think uh, it's creating a conversation. And the best way to create a conversation is from a place of respect. I think if we start there, the conversation tends to be better and it tends to be most beneficial to the audience. So respect is, I think, kind of the foundation, how we start. And then we'll have a conversation. And, and sometimes uh, having a good conversation that's truly fruitful requires a little bit of pushback and also some sensitivity and to allow someone to truly make their point, whether you agree or not. Yeah. I, and, uh, you know, the term pushback, that's actually a term that you use when you interview people. You'll actually kind of give them that warning. Say, well, let me push back on that for a minute, which which I, I love because it, it makes us all think harder. It, it makes us try to get to the core of what we want to communicate. But it also lets, you know, it lets us know, hey, we're not here just to, you know, find a, some straw man and beat up on it. We really want to get to the truth. Yeah. And you know what? I think an interview is about broadening the marketplace of ideas and whoever you're interviewing, your subject, they are the expert. That's why you're having them on. Whether you agree or not, they are the expert in whatever subject matter. And so it's not about debating. It's not about challenging. It is about pushing back, finding maybe a different perspective or challenging uh, that thought process. But again, even though I don't I don't even really like using the word challenge, but I would say a respectful challenge. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you really modeled that. And I'm, uh, we, we got a few, we just did an interview, I think together last week uh, where you were, uh, co you were anchoring somebody else's show while they were right. not there that day. Uh, and maybe we can post that in our press room too. So everybody can see that, but uh, Terrence, uh, this may be a risk, but I want to ask you to comment a little bit on, uh, what you see about the integrity of journalism today. Because, you know, my compliment to you is kind of a backhanded compliment to so many others in the industry who don't have those kinds of practices. Um, you know, what do you see when you look around the industry as a whole? I, I always tell people journalism is a business first and foremost. And um, I am one of those people I always say I wear big J on my chest. Um, so for me, while it is a business it's also a vocation in my mind. It's also a public service at its roots. Um, but because people tend to get paid for it and because it is 
a big industry, an overarching industry, sometimes the truth gets caught up in business. The truth gets watered down by money. And that's just the reality. Um, anybody who tells you otherwise is lying to him or herself or they're being naive. Now, I think it's incumbent on each of us as journalists to say, OK, well, my reputation is more important to me. Telling the truth, um, being right, being accurate is most important to me. Um, and so that's kind of how I go about my job every day is to make sure that what I'm saying uh, and that what I'm reporting is credible, that it's accurate, that it's fact-based, um, and that I'm able to do so in a way that I can attribute the sources that I'm talking about. Um, and, and again, that's just fundamental basic journalism. But I think, unfortunately, in our current day and age, that fundamental basic journalism is given way to profits and the other thing is just because people are reporting news or reporting information doesn't necessarily make them journalists. Uh, and that's a broader conversation, I think, about kind of the state of, of our world where anyone with a camera can uh, can can create information or disseminate information to an audience. But just because you have an audience doesn't mean that you're doing journalism. That's a whole nother conversation. We don't have that. Yeah. Much <laughs> Let me ask you a question. I've I've never really been able to quite articulate this before, but the way you're explaining this is helping me. Um, I've been on some shows where and there's usually usually another guest. So you got kind of the host and then the other guest. So it's two against one. And the I would say the progressive narrative or the leftist narrative in some cases is actually assumed to be true. And then I'm I feel like I'm on the defensive right from the start. And I, you know, I, I feel like I, I know how to get in there and question the assumptions that are below the questions. Mm -hmm. but, and you mentioned that this is about money. It's about profits. These journalism companies or businesses that are trying to be profitable. Why, why um, would they move toward the progressive left if profits are the goal? Because it seems like that's not that big of a part of the population. I wish I had that answer. I'll give you a theory. Um, typically, and particularly nowadays, the left is in power, or largely, the left is in power. And so in order to have the inside track, in order to have access, you tend to lean towards a specific narrative, the narrative that supports your access will help you gain access in order to remain relevant and profitable, ultimately. That is okay. my theory. Um, and here's the other thing. What tends to happen, and, and I come out of a world of local journalism, so I'm not telling you what I've heard. I'm telling you what I know. Um, you can only report, well, you can't only report, but you largely report what you're told. And I'll just break it down, say, to a police department. Um, there's a situation and police tell you what it is. Well, because it's an institution, the police department, these are institutions you trust the institution. Their word should be a uh, bond because they're the police department. Well, oftentimes then you find out, oh, well, just because the police officer said such, that wasn't necessarily accurate or they spun it. And that's where being a good journalist comes in, not necessarily taking the word of one person, but double sourcing it, finding other sources to corroborate. Um, but in our current industry, particularly when you're turning things like literally, you know, when when everything is on the clock, it's about just churning out information. Oftentimes, journalists don't necessarily take the time or I'll even say have the time to corroborate sources and to really uh, delve deeply into the subject matter they're covering. And so I think that's one of the problems. And, and that's just uh, it's that's just how the industry is gone. Uh, it's about churning out information. It's about churning out content, not necessarily focusing exclusively on turning out solid content. Yeah, I, I wonder, you know, and I, I'm sure that's true in mainstream companies, conservative companies, liberal companies. I mean, we we were over visiting the Daily Caller, uh, yeah. you know, dailycaller.dc.com and, uh, you know, big news source. And it's, it's a lot of young people who are um, right. uh, honing their skills and they're, they were wonderful, very respectful, good writers. And I asked one of them, so how many articles, cause like I've had articles in daily caller before, um, how many articles like that do you have to write? And they're like, Oh, two or three, like two or three a week. No, no, no. Two or three every day. 
mm-hmm. two or three every day that we have to produce like that. Right. Uh, it's a huge writing schedule. So the point you're making is really important. You have to trust somebody or make some assumptions about the way you're going to approach the narrative or you just can't get the work done. And that's it. There's just this requirement for content, the the amount of content. And that's huge these days. And I think that as a result, journalism in general is suffering. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not going to tell my age, but I've been doing this for quite some time. I remember you turned one story a day. You had the story. You came in at nine o'clock in the morning or whatever the time was. And you worked on that. And you really worked to tell a full and balanced story. Nowadays, particularly in local television, and I'll, I'll just talk about that, you may be telling, you may be doing two separate stories and you still have to do what we call a VOSAP, which is basically a third story on something else. And so there's just not enough time in the day to really fully focus and make sure that you get a full and balanced account of whatever you're reporting on. And that's just where the business is. It's unfortunate, but it is the reality. Well, this is going to be really helpful. I I know the people who are watching or listening right now, you know, a lot of people who've been through a Summit Ministries two-week program, now they're in their career. Parents whose kids came to the Summit Ministries program, you know, they're mostly Christians, mostly Mm -hmm. um, irritated at what they see in in the mainstream media. And uh, this, this helps kind of explain a little bit of the context behind all of that. Okay, let me let me just ask you, Terrence, mm-hmm. uh, to talk about your show because the main the main show that you do, American Sunrise, uh, this is the morning show for Real America's Voice, right. and uh, I've been on the show. Um, Ed and Karen are great to to work with. Uh, the only thing is that I want to be where they are uh, physically in their physical, <laughs> like. Like who gets to who gets to broadcast their morning show from the beach? In Florida, yes. Uh, I, now, go ahead. Yeah, no, no. I just, but I want you to tell us about the show, and I want you to talk about the network too, because I think this is so interesting. How um, new networks are rising up. Mm-hmm. You know, you have you have the legacy ones, obviously ABC, NBC, CBS. Their news segments are so tiny now. Like it, you know, it might be a twenty-five minute long show, but it's actually. 12 minutes of commercials, you know, and then teasing the rest of the show. And that takes most of the time. Then you've got Fox News and CNN um, doing news all of the time. But then these new networks that are coming up, News Nation, Newsmax, uh, Real America's Voice, and uh, more and more people are tuning in and, and getting... Uh, you, you, can't, you can't assume anymore if you work for CNN that you're setting the opinions for America, I guess is what, right. the way I'd put it. And you know what? Again, as I was saying earlier, I'm one of those people, I've got a big J on my chest. Um, I, I, I really see journalism as a public service and I take it very seriously as an art form, as a craft, as a vocation. So when you say you're not necessarily setting the opinion of the country, well, in my mind, journalism is about setting opinion. Uh, I give you context. Hopefully I'm able to put perspective to the story of the day, but I trust our viewers to come up with their own opinion. I trust our viewers to take the information that I've given them, the context that I've provided, the perspective that I've provided, and to make their own decision. It's not about me creating a decision for someone. Now, unfortunately, again, we're talking industry. Unfortunately, the industry has now moved very much more towards that, to where it's about opinion, it's about pundits, it's about creating a narrative. No, I'm telling you a story. I'm putting it in context for you, I'm putting it in perspective for you, but I trust you. You're smart enough. In fact, it's funny, my mom, you know, I always got to trust my mom. Um, (laughs) My mom, who is probably one of my biggest critics, you know, she'll call, oh, you shouldn't have said this, I didn't like your word choice. I'll say, okay, mom. And so... (laughs) There was one day and, you know, I was anchoring a show and the consultants had come in and said, you know, well, look, just speak regular everyday English. Like, you know, just the language that you use, keep it very basic because you just want to make sure that your audience understands everything and that they don't feel like you're trying to talk over their heads. Okay. So of course I followed what the, uh, what the consultant said. And so my mom said, I sent you to school for way too long for you to be using this. You've got a vocabulary, use your vocabulary. So I said, well, mom, you know, this is what the consultant said. She said, 
I'm not an idiot. I'm one of your viewers. I'm not an idiot. And I want someone who has a nice vocabulary and who challenges me and, and speaks in a way that I can trust. There's something to be said about that. Mom is always yeah. right. People are smart enough. <laughs> People are smart yeah, enough. Viewers yeah. are smart enough. So I don't have to tell them how to think. I give them perspective. I'll give them context, tell them what's going on, give them the facts, and they'll decide for themselves. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that, and that's the way the world should work, it seems to me, that if you give people the information yeah. and, and the information is openly and freely shared, then people should be able to arrive at the truth. We're not always going to all get to the exact same place at the exact same time. That's not what you're looking for. But, uh, man, I, I appreciate that. This is this is really refreshing. Hey, do you remember, did you ever watch uh, back in the day a uh, firing line with William F. Buckley? No, I did not. I've so. And, and here's probably why. So I'm a military brat. I grew up in Germany. Yeah. I had German television. I didn't really have a, uh, American television. So there are lots of things uh, from the 70s, 80s, and early 90s that yeah. I missed. So I have never yeah. seen that. No, sorry. Well, you know, I, I hadn't seen it. I remember a, a, one of my teachers in high school was crazy about it. She talked about it all the time. She was my Latin teacher. Okay. And, uh, and so when I was in college, um, I was the president of the student government and the uh, college said, hey, would you like to have William F. Buckley come to do a taping uh, at your school <clears throat> of this program, Firing Line? And uh, William F. Buckley, of course, the founder of National Review magazine, you know, he kind of sits back in his chair, and, you know, very, I, I mean, you want it, it, try to picture a very patrician looking Yale educated guy, mm -hmm. but he was conservative he was well-spoken he was funny he interviewed people who had a totally different point of view and they seemed fine with it and it, you know they hadn't they could make a great show together anyway i, I just i just missed that yeah. um and you know one part of what i think made it great and by the way i'm not just saying it was great as in oh this is sort of interesting you know must be that 10 or 15 people watched it no, no, no. It was on. It was PBS. It was like an evening show. Millions of people watched every single episode. Um, but it. But I, I mentioned it because you mentioned vocabulary. William F. Buckley had this enormous vocabulary. There was never a show where you wouldn't have to go back and look up something that he had said. What is that word? I don't. I don't want to admit that I don't know that. But uh, yeah. Well, there's something to be said about that. I think people want information from smart people. And I'm not necessarily insinuating that I'm smart because I, I definitely am not. I think I'm informed. I think I'm fairly well read and I'm definitely inquisitive. Um, but I think people want their information uh, from sources that they know uh, have the, some real context about that information and, and have done some some real investigation and thinking about the topic they're talking about. Yeah. Uh, what about, um, I'm just curious about, about debates, because um, I know some, some programs have sort of taken the idea that we're going to get two people from two op opposing viewpoints, mm -hmm. and then, then there's this narrative. When I, so when I was in college, coming through, the narrative was sort of this, um, well, you never want to give voice to the other side. Because that that's showing that they have legitimacy, and and by even allowing them to share the platform, you're giving them a legitimacy that they have not earned. And so, uh, like when I was in graduate school, and I won't say what school it was, but they had no interest in bringing speakers of differing viewpoints to campus because they didn't believe in it. Hmm. And I just wonder if if we'd gone too far in that direction where people don't even realize, man, there might be other people out there who disagree with you. Is there a role for that? Is, you know, how do you reclaim that as a journalist? So journalistically, I think that really hits to the heart of what you should be doing, what any journalist, any journalist of assault should be doing. Really telling your community what you're, what you're doing should be reflective of your community and it should be about broadening the marketplace of ideas in one's community. And I always give this example, and it's extreme, but uh, I, I hope that if in this situation, I would respond this way. Uh, this might be surprising for you to know, but I'm a black guy. So I would be more than willing to sit down with a white supremacist and do an interview. Mm -hmm. Now, 
do I think those views are legitimate? Personally, no. But as a journalist, I think it is my job to probe to find out where those viewpoints are coming from, to find out why those views exist. And I think it's fair to question them. Um, but again, from an informed place, not an emotional place, from an informed place to question them. Um, and I think if you do that respectfully, hopefully it will broaden the marketplace of ideas. Hopefully it will create understanding amongst the audience and maybe even create understanding between the two people, between the interviewer mm -hmm. and the interviewee. I think life in general is about relationships. And so I'm a firm believer if we're having a conversation, and again, I don't like to do interviews. I like to have conversations. But if we're having a conversation, we're interviewing, however, however you want to term it. If we're doing so, as I said from the beginning, from a place of respect, and if I, as the interviewer, am entering that conversation um, with a mind of inquisition, being inquisitive and truly uh, interested in what you have to say and understanding one's position, even if I disagree with it, then that, I think, makes for a good interview. And that's the fundamental. That's the heart of journalism. I'm not here to debate you. I'm here to understand you. And yes, push back, question, probe. But this isn't a debate. You, again, as the as the interviewee, as the source, are the source. You're the expert in the subject matter. That's why I ask you on. And so out of respect, I'm going to allow you to speak your piece. That doesn't mean we'll agree. That doesn't mean that in the end, you'll have convinced me, but I've given you a forum to speak. And I think that's the heart of journalism. I'd love to take a few minutes and just talk about uh, two things, really. One, I'm just curious, what are some of the, uh, who are some of the people that you've talked to that you've enjoyed interacting with and who are, you know, having that kind of dialogue that you're talking about, uh, you know, your favorite interviews, who are some people you would like to interview and why? And then um, I'm going to ask the final question, which is for the young adults who are here, uh, how to bring out that journalistic impulse with integrity, whether they're in the journalism field or not. Gotcha. So, so uh, I, I'm sure there are favorites that I've had, um, but I really try to look at it as each individual, uh, each individual interview is my favorite. That moment, that time um, is a unique time. Uh, that person has a unique story, a unique perspective. And so at that moment, my full engagement is with that person. So that person is my favorite. Um, now, there are obviously interviews that go better than others. There, there are people that I've spoken with over the years who I really have had more chemistry with. And so it really has been a more robust conversation. Um, one of the people that comes to mind is um, Andy Biggs. I, I tend to have him on the show a lot, uh, the congressman from Arizona. Um, I think he's just an engaging person. I think he's an honest, straight shooter. And I appreciate that. That's the kind of, you know, I'm going to ask you the questions. Don't BS me. Just be honest. <laughs> be honest. Yeah. Tell it like it is. And I, I think I'm that kind of guy. I'm a tell it like it is kind of person. Um, and so I think I appreciate that. Um, Mark Meadows, former uh, former congressman of North Carolina, also a former White House chief of staff to President Trump. He's always been a good interview. I think he and I uh, have had some great conversations. And, and again, I think he's a straight shooter. Um, who else have I really enjoyed? And I'm trying to think of recently. Um, Oh, Marsha Blackburn. Now, I, oh, and yeah. I interviewed, so I worked in Memphis, Tennessee for a long time. So we're talking decades ago at this point. Um, and I interviewed her when she was first running for Senate. Like, I remember walking wow. down the street with her as she was campaigning. Um, and that was that was enjoyable. And in retrospect, it's enjoyable because I see where she is now and the stature that she enjoys now. But I remember way back when. Um, yeah. And I remember when... Uh, you know, I could have a conversation with her that wasn't quite as politicized. And I'm not saying that everything is politicized, but, you know, it was grassroots. It was very raw. It was here's what I want to do. It was firebrand. And now we see a much more seasoned politician. Um, but to look back at from when she came to where she is now, um, I truly appreciate that as well. Yeah, those are great examples. It, who would be your some people you'd you see, you see them or hear them doing other things and think, man, I'd really like to uh, get them on my show, have a conversation with them. Any sitting president, I don't care if he's Republican, <laughs> Democrat, independent, any sitting president would love to do that. Um, 
I, I always say, like, I've been asked this question before, and this is so out of the realm of, of reality. <laughs> but um, Jesus. Yes. Like, <laughs> well, doesn't get yeah. any better than that. Like, and, yeah. and I get people like, what? What's he talking? But, like, seriously, if there was an interview yeah. to be had, if there's the interview to have, that's it. If I could somehow funnel the spiritual world and, and, and get a response and ask questions, like that would be the one. Um, I would love to talk to a pope. Um, yeah. You know, I think that would be interesting. I have questions. Um, so yeah, 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 I mean, there would be so many. But I mean, you know, yes. those would be like, <laughs> and, and yeah. I get, you know, well, I talk to Jesus all the time, getting a response <laughs> orally yeah, or something yeah. like that will happen. But like that would be, you know, talk about change the world. Be changing the yeah. world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could kind of get get inside a little bit. You know, what are you? What were you thinking? And what you know? What was what happened in this situation? That kind of thing. Um, I've always thought that if I could uh, interview anybody, I, I'd go back and and these might one of these might be a little tough because the guy's kind of grumpy. But Winston Churchill, okay. and I'd want to interview. I'd want to interview Ronald Reagan. Okay, that was a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those would be those would be fun. Well, I got I've got to just ask you this question because I know a lot of people who are watching and listening, and we've had a couple of shows here and there talking to people who are journalists. Um, if you were going to give advice to a young person going into journalism today, uh, what would your advice be? But I want I want to. There's an asterisk to this question. Okay. I want to know what about that advice applies even if you're not going to be in journalism to be a good thinker and a good consumer of news? So there are a couple of things. First and foremost, tell the truth. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Tell the truth. Tell it like it is. But the only way you can tell the truth is if you've done your research, you have fact-checked what you're saying, and you're telling the facts as you know them within the context of the story or adding context and perspective to them for your viewers, first and foremost. And that's pretty easy to do, I think. Yeah. The other thing I would say is journalism or reporting on any story is about relationships and it's about, it's about creating an atmosphere. And so in order to do those things, you have to shut up sometimes and listen. Let the other people talk. The story's not about you. It's about that person. And that can be a challenge. There seems to be this kind of natural inclination for many of us to just talk and talk and talk, make it about us. No, the best thing you can do is just be quiet, even in those uncomfortable moments where the person you're interviewing may not be saying anything or they're thinking, instead of trying to jump in and help them, just shut up, mm. be quiet mm. and let them talk. Sometimes yeah. those moments are even more powerful than we realize. Yeah. Um, and probably the final thing would be be sensitive. Be sensitive to the situation. Um, and I think that's a skill. That's not something that one can learn. It's a skill that that is just innate. Either you have that in you or you don't. Um, and, and I've worked with a lot of great journalists who didn't have that. Yeah. You know, they were just gruff people. They quite honestly weren't very nice people. Good journalists, smart well-read, but just weren't very nice people, weren't very kind people, weren't, weren't compassionate people. And I think compassion goes a very long way when you're telling a story. Um, yeah. You know, sometimes compassion fills those gaps that, we, that, that aren't said. It fills those gaps of information that aren't said. If you have some compassion, you get um, what's being yeah. conveyed. You feel what's being conveyed. And then hopefully yeah. you convey that same feeling in your reporting. You know, it occurs to me that the thing, the point, the key points that you've made <clears throat> about what makes good journalism, you know, that you that you listen respectfully, that you push back, that you uh, tell the truth and let the other person talk, and that you express compassion, are also the elements of friendship. Absolutely, absolutely, and I, I think friendship is so key um, to life. You know. Friendship truly is essential to one's soul. Um, and again, that's why I try to say, and interviewing is kind of the overarching term we use, it's the industry term, but I try to have conversations because you speak 
to your friends. And I feel like an audience, engaging with an audience is about a relationship. It's about a friendship. It's not, oh, I'm up here and you're down there, you little peons, I'm talking to you. No, it's about engaging. It's a back and forth. And hopefully yeah. it's a sharing of information. Um, and I've been told that that's one of the reasons viewers uh, like what I do. And one of the things they appreciate me, uh, about me is I'm the same guy that you meet in the grocery store that I am on TV. Not going to change. I'm the same guy. And it's because I think it's quite honestly made me a better journalist because I'm reporting on the things that are important to you because they're also important to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think what you've said is accurate. Um, I, you come across as a, a guy I want to trust. I want to listen to. I want to talk to and and who, um, you know, who's a friend. Not, you know, no, not a pushover kind of everything you say is right kind of friend, but the real kind of friend, you know, who who wants to really engage with you, man, may your tribe increase in the world of journalism. Thank you. <laughs> it's Thank been you. really I, fun to talk to you. I think we will. Um, and, and again, you know, that's part of the beauty of journalism. Each of us. So I'm just going to end with this. Uh, a journalism professor once told me that everything we cover is about perspective. If I look out the window and you look out the window, we'll see the same thing, but what's important, what stands out to us will be very different. And that's what journalism is about. But isn't that what life is about? Just yeah. because we're looking at the same thing doesn't mean the same thing stands out to us. And so all I can do is report on what stands out to me. But the context of what both of us see is the same. Yeah. Terrence Bates, thanks so much for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you and inviting me. Thank you to my guest today, Terrence Bates, for being on the show. You can access the network that Terrence is part of called Real America's Voice. His show is called American Sunrise, but you go to americasvoice.news. If you click on American Sunrise, you can see how Terrence puts into practice what he was talking about on our program today, about being interested, being respectful, pushing back, but doing it in a compassionate way. All of those things that are so essential to how we live life in a society that seems to be more and more fractured. Well, the Apostle Paul told his protege, Timothy, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. As Christians, we're always trying to do that. How do we teach the truth? How do we communicate the truth? How do we do it with respect and with gentleness so that people are won over? I hope that you're able to do that a little bit better this week because of the time we spent with Terrence. I'm Dr. Jeff. Thanks for joining the Dr. Jeff Show podcast this week. Hey, everybody. The Dr. Jeff Show podcast is part of the ministry of Summit Ministries. Now, we're in the Summit Ministries studio, the Mike S. Adams studio here in Manitou Springs, Colorado. This studio was built by people like you, people who gave a few dollars, some who were able to give thousands of dollars. But they built the studio and millions of people are being reached through the work that takes place here. Let me present you with another opportunity. How would you like to have that kind of a legacy in the life of a young person this year? You could sponsor a young person to attend one of our Summit Ministries two-week programs. Basically, it's $33 an hour for training a young person, and they'll receive about 60 hours of training during those two weeks. You could sponsor an hour or two or three or maybe more. Maybe you'd want to sponsor a young person to attend. I personally interact with young adults who've been through this program and whose lives have been completely changed. Some of them in just one hour of teaching changed the whole course of their lives. Would you help us get young adults trained who are going to be the leaders for the next generation? Listeners, I want you to know that our podcast is on Edify, which is a truly powerful app that brings together thousands of the best Christian podcasts in one place for your listening enjoyment. You can download it at edify, E-D-I-F-I dot app. Be sure to share this show if you have enjoyed listening to it and leave a review if you would on the site where you download the show. That helps more people know about the Dr. Jeff Show, and I'll look forward to seeing you next week.